<clears throat> All right. We are live. Sorry, I'm a little bit late. But here we are. We are ready to start. So I'm going to wait a little bit for some more people to start filling in. But um, yeah, I have it set up now. So today, uh, today we'll be able to show my iPad while I'm drawing and answer your questions so you don't have to just look at my ugly mug the whole time. So we'll wait a little bit longer for some more people to show up. But uh, if you'd like, you can go ahead and start dropping questions in the chat um, to uh, let people, let me know what uh, what you want to talk about today. So welcome everybody. See you guys down there pouring in. Let me uh, start getting the screen share for my iPad set up. All right, let's see here. All right, here we go. Can you guys all see that? Let me know in the chat if this is showing up or not working. It's the first time I've tried this, so um, let me know. You guys see it? Radio silence, all right. All right, well, um, no one's saying they can't see it, so um, I'm just going to go ahead and then start. Unless, let me just check one more thing. Make sure that I'm not missing and missing the chat. Oh, okay. Well, that's annoying. So, looks like okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna have to look at two different screens to get the chat going. Okay, one second. I apologize. Okay, that's better. I think we uh, have the chat up. Awesome. You guys can still see, right? And the mouse is a bit loud. Okay. All right. Cool. So uh, I see the first question. I just got my iPad and pen. What do you suggest trying to get started? Doesn't really matter. Whatever I suggest drawing something that you like drawing, you'll be more motivated to push through the learning curve uh, than if you pick something that you're not comfortable with or that's hard. So that's my advice. Um, that being said, let's jump in. Um, I didn't really have anything prepared today of what I was going to paint. I don't have any projects I need to work on right now. So um, yeah, what do you guys think? What should I? Uh, is there any techniques that you're interested in me showing, or you just want to see me paint something? Let me know. I'm just gonna start sketching while uh, while the questions come in and hear you guys have to say. Seems like I mean I guess it makes sense. Seems like there's a little bit of a delay between when I talk and when the questions come in. Or you guys are super slow typers, but um, I'm pretty sure it's the other one. All right, first question. How can I understand face anatomy? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, other than, I mean, the answer is just to practice a lot. Um, that is, I mean, kind of the only way to learn to understand face anatomy. So aside from that, there's not really any sort of secret. Andrew Loomis has some really great stuff on face anatomy and... Um, Proko, if you go to uh, proko.com or his YouTube channel, Stan Prokopenko, he's got some great stuff on how to 
do facial anatomy. I mean, it really just takes practice. That's really not my strong point. If I paint a face, I can't really paint it out of my head. I really got to use a lot of reference and um, to really get it right. But um, San Progopanko has the best stuff. I'm having a feeling this is going to be uh, not as easy as I thought it would be to talk and draw something on the spot at the same time um, and answer questions. Hello, Mr. Bachelor. Would you be willing to draw a dugong? Uh, I don't even know what that is. Let me look it up. Um, everyone teaches it different. It's a Pokemon. What about color transitions? I'd like to see that. Can you maybe specify a little bit more what you mean by color transitions? Um, painting from value in grayscale and adding color and procreate is difficult for me. Any suggestions? How do you pick a pleasing color scheme? Okay, so this is what we're going to do today. I'm looking up a picture of a dugong right now. We're going to paint a dugong. Oh, okay, yeah, I know what that is. Um, we're going to paint my take on a dugong, and then I'm going to show you... Well, I mean, dugong's white, so you can't... There's not a lot of color. Um, we'll, we'll do this. We'll paint something. Um, I guess we'll go with the dugong, and we can just show you how to add different types of color. And we'll go how to go from grayscale to... Um, Maybe a chameleon. Yeah, we'll we'll sketch some stuff out. So um, we're gonna do a dugong. My take on a dugong, and then we're we're gonna go over adding grayscale and color and all that stuff. So um, let's jump right in. If I don't answer any questions for a minute, it's because I'm looking down at my iPad and not up at the comments. So um, and I want to. I thought I set up. Oh, okay. That's right. I didn't think I got it working, but I did. So, what we're going to do, I have, for those of you who don't know what Super Chat is, I have Super Chat set up, and it's a way where you can uh, donate money if you want to support me. And I'm going, because there's so many comments coming in, um, Super Chat comments I'm going to put to the top um, of the of the priority list. Um, and then next time we'll use the super chats to determine what I'm going to draw. So, um, let's jump in though with the dugong for today. So he's kind of like a, a seal sort of guy with a horn on his head. So as usual, I always start out with blocking out the shapes really roughly. And you want to keep it pretty loose. We're not jumping into any detail yet. Yeah, man, I don't know. I think I can pull it off, but I don't know what it is about drawing in front of people on a live stream, but it's a little nerve wracking. Even though I do tutorials and and courses all the time, it still feels a little bit scary. All right, take a look up at the chat here really quick. Um, let's see here. Love Legend of the Cryptids, but I have issues in converting line drawings to color renderings. I've seen some people going from black and white to color, but it seems to look too metallic. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I can do a video on that sometime. I think that personally, I don't I don't really like painting that way because I feel like it's easy 
to really get stale colors when you do that. Um, I don't know. I just think it's better to actually paint right on the canvas with your colors instead of doing it in grayscale first. There are some benefits, like you can get um, really solid values when you do that, but I don't know. Not really my cup of tea. I think that it's better to just paint straight on. But like I said, that's my style. There's lots of ways to do it. It's um, it's totally, up, I mean, it's up to you. It's your painting, but um, maybe try experimenting with a couple other options and see if you can get it done that way, the same effect perhaps, but there's no necessarily one perfect right way to paint. There's lots of different styles. It's totally up to you how you want to take a crack at things. So, yeah, I'm not liking, I'm not crazy about that fin placement. So I'm going to rework that some. I said, always oh, start really loose. I'm not going crazy on the details because what I'm going to do is make a new layer and go in on that layer and refine it. I feel like I need to uh, perhaps look at some references, some seals, or go with kind of how a dugong has those more flowery sort of fins, almost like a like a fish. Maybe we'll go with that. Let's do that. I think that might look interesting. I think next time also what I'll do see if I can have my wife or my brother or something come in here and read off the questions while I'm drawing, then I don't have to keep looking up at the screen. So thanks for being patient while we figure this out next week. Uh, hopefully it will get even better. So um, let's see. Can you talk about warm and cool color for shading? Do buying courses on Udemy support you? Yes, buying courses on Udemy does support me. Um, that's how I make my main source of income is teaching on Udemy. So um, if you buy a course, I would really appreciate that. I love your style, so I will definitely follow your advice. Thank you, Hugo. So back to uh, warm and cool color for shading. So typically the rule of thumb when you're, um, when you're painting is that you have, you have, uh, warm colors for your light and cool colors for your shadows, but it can also be vice versa. It doesn't have to be that way. All you want to make sure you're focusing on is that they're different, right? You don't really most of the time want cool shadows and cool light because it's going to, it's going to be pretty bland and pretty boring if you do that. And the more that you can break that up, the more interesting and visually appealing it's gonna be. So the reason why, let's say you're in a, a basic sort of outdoor setting, the reason why that's the case is because, sorry, I'm doing such a bad job drawing and talking at the same time. I think I'll get better with practice, but oh man, it's rough. Um, so anyways, the, um, the point is that when you're outside, the sunlight is yellow, so it's going to be warm, and your light source is going to have a little bit of a warm tint to it. And because you're outside, there's also the ambient light of the sky, which is blue, right? Think of the light, the sky as a big blue fill light, a soft sort of diffused fill light um, for your painting. And because of that, the shadows where a lot of that reflected light is going to show up at that's not getting hit directly by the sunlight is going to be uh, cooler because it has that blue light or it might be reflected from grass below or something around, but it's more likely than not going to be pretty cool. So because of that, you want your highlights to be warm and your shadows to be cool. Now, in some circumstances that might be switched around, um, you might have that almost like the opposite. For example, if you're in the moonlight, 
you want your highlights to be cool because this moon is considered somewhat of a cool light source and your shadows to be warm. And the reason you want your shadows to be warm is because you just want it to contrast with that blue, right? If everything is blue, it's going to come across monochromatic. In some instances, that might be what you're going for, but there's a lot where it's not what you're going for. And so breaking that up is going to help your painting out quite a bit. All right. I think that's uh, about as good as we're going to get on this... Um, on this rough sketch. I think I'll have some fins on his back here as well for my dugong. I know there's gonna be people who are like, that's not what a dugong looks like. All right. Um, so before I go on, we're gonna make a new layer here and we'll start doing our second layer. Let me take a, a look at the questions really quick. I always, when I make a new layer, um, and I'm doing a rough sketch, I always lower the opacity so that it's not too distracting and then I can draw on top and refine it a little more. Um, which brushes do you use more often? So for drawing, I almost always use the technical pencil with the max size increased, or um, as Mike Henry calls it, the fat pencil. Um, just the standard technical pencil and Procreate, brush size, max brush size turned up so it can get a little bit thicker. And then for painting, I've been trying to switch it up lately and try different painting styles, but a lot of times I use the round brush, but with I had edited it a little edited it a little bit, but uh Procreate with the newest update undid my edits for that brush. I'm gonna have to go back and refigure out what it was, but I put a taper on it and took off the uh, the opacity a taper instead put a size taper and then um also turned up the jitter so that it wasn't so smooth like that and yeah i'd have to mess with it later but those are the m brushes that use the most i've also been trying to use the oil paint brush and mess around with that it's a little bit hard to have control of because sometimes it like the way the stamp is set up, it won't paint if you're painting really small and it mixes around your paint quite a bit. So I like that, but it can be tricky. Um, I used to also use the charcoal block brush a lot. Sometimes I still do, but those are the ones I use the most. Um, let's see. Hi, I just, hi, just a tech question. When I paint on Procreate, I use the airbrush. When I zoom in, when working on small drawings, the quality gets fuzzy. Not sure if it's the brush or canvas size. Um, it is the canvas size. So when you zoom in and you're working on a smaller drawing, you can. I'm working at 11 by 15 inches at 300 dpi. So the resolution on this is really high. It's a really big image. So I'd have to zoom in pretty far, but you could see eventually it's going to get pixelated, and that's because it's only set up to have so many pixels per inch. So if your DPI is low, it's going to get pixelated a lot faster. If your, um, oops, if your canvas size is small, it's going to get pixelated a lot faster. And keep in mind though, that even though if we zoom in and look at it up close, it's really pixelated. It doesn't mean it looks pixelated when we zoom out. So if you're zoomed in painting with your airbrush and it looks pixelated, it might still look fine from a zoomed out distance. So, check and see you might be okay um line art is also difficult would love to see you talk about that more in the future all right uh can you expand on that a little bit more what uh what do you feel like is difficult about line art in particular that you that you feel like you struggle with um maybe if you're a little bit more detailed i can give you a little bit better answer so I'm going to bring my brush down quite a bit so you can get a little bit cleaner lines. This is the uh, probably what we're probably going to do. Well, yeah, I already said we were going to do this. We're going to do the grayscale thing. So you can see going from grayscale to color. Just to give you an example, but like I said, I recommend actually not painting this way, in my opinion. I don't know. I guess that's not entirely true. Sometimes sometimes I do paint this way. 
on rare occasions where where it will help me, but we'll show you we'll show you how to get some color variation in there so it doesn't look flat and metallic. A big part of that is going to be when you're doing your values, um, you gotta think about the texture of what it is that you're painting. Not everything has the same specularity or amount of highlights on it. Some things are shinier, some things are more matte and dull, and you gotta take that into account. You can't just paint everything as if it's made out of the same sort of smooth, shiny plastic material because it's gonna, it'll look weird. All right. Kind of want to capture that, the shape of his eye, but still keep it somewhat realistic. Okay, little ear hole back here. I'm going to bring the opacity down on that layer underneath a little bit more. All right. <clears throat> um, making line art look clean. It just muted the new update for program make every brush more streamlined. I don't know. I haven't noticed yet. Maybe I did have that jitter problem where it was it was like doing the dotted line thing, but I got that fixed. Um, which brush to use for sketching, inking, and coloring? And where to put hard lines versus where to put softer lines? Let's go one at a time. So <clears throat> making line art look clean. One is going to be to do what I'm doing, which is um, building things up in layers instead of just jumping right in and trying to get really detailed in your drawing. So you can see that I have this really rough, dirty line sketch underneath, but now that I'm coming on top, I can make it quite a bit cleaner and prettier and I can be a lot more confident in my line strokes because I'm almost just sort of like tracing over what I already painted earlier, what I already drew earlier. That's one way. Um, the other thing is to try not to draw from your wrist so much. Um, the more that you move your shoulder when you draw instead of your wrist, the more smooth and more control you can have over your lines. When you're drawing with just your wrist, it can be really hard to get a smooth line. You can also start, another thing that a lot of beginner artists do that you should really try and avoid is this sort of thing where you're like, like let's say I'm trying to draw um, the shape of an eye and I really want him to look mad, right? So a lot of beginner artists, when they're doing this, so they'll do something like this where they draw a whole bunch of lines like this, call these fuzzy lines. I used to do this too. I don't know why other people do it, but I used to do it because I thought like, oh, this kind of looks like that loose, rough sketch style that I'm going for, where it seems like there's a lot of lines everywhere that look really sketchy, and I think that looks really cool. It also helps me course correct as I go a lot, because it's not just one solid line I don't have to commit, but it looks really bad. It's We call those fuzzy lines. You don't want fuzzy lines. Uh, you want to draw confidently. One way to solve this, it's it's scary and it's really hard, but the way I fixed it is I started drawing, um, when I before I started working digitally, I would only draw with ink, with pens, and do all of my, all my art doing ink stuff. And it got rid of it really fast because, um, because it, I couldn't, 
I couldn't erase stuff and I had to be a lot more confident in my mark making. And so <clears throat> it ended up kind of curing that. If you're looking for sort of like a quick fix, you can always go to the brush settings and just turn the streamline up right here. And what that will do, I'll show you an example. If I come over here and draw a squiggly line like this, that's without the streamline. If I turn the streamline all the way up and I try and do that again, smooths things out quite a bit. And this makes it so that when you're drawing, you can create really smooth lines and you can go anywhere in between on that streamline. Um, doo -doo -doo. What brush do I use for sketching, inking, and coloring? So I <clears throat> already kind of mentioned that earlier. I use this brush that I'm using right now, which is a technical pencil with just the, um, the max size turned up. I also use the, uh, for coloring, I use the, sorry, hard to think and talk while I'm doing this part. Apologize. Um, yeah, I don't, already don't like that. Um, I use, I'll just take a moment to answer this. Um, kind of already went over it, technical pencil um, for, Inking, I don't do a ton of inking. I use one of the inking brushes, whichever one suits my needs at the time. Uh, I think that Studio Pen works pretty good. And then coloring, whatever floats my boat, round brush a lot of times is the main one that I use. Um, I struggle with line art mainly about where to put the harder lines and where to put the softer lines. So I'm assuming by softer lines, you mean thinner lines. Um, I'm not really sure how you can have a soft line. Maybe I don't understand your question. Um, but as far as that goes, what I would recommend would be, um, I think the best thing to do as a general rule of thumb, all, always, I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule. So don't, don't freak out if you, you know, there's an artist that you're like, oh, well, they do this. Um, there's always exceptions, but generally what it is a good idea to do is to put the uh, heavier lines where there's going to be shadow. So for example, um, I should put a heavier line. If I was focusing on this as a drawing instead of as a, a painting, I would pay attention to this more. But um, heavy stuff down here on like the bottom where there's shadows and lighter lines on top where it's lighter right so um heavy line light line heavy line at the top of the eyelid light line at the bottom another thing you can do just to give an example really quick is the closer things are in the foreground the darker you want the lines to be and the further away things are in the foreground or in the background the lighter you want lines to be and that will really help sell the drawing as well um yeah, typically shadow side is going to get heavier, darker line work. Light little detail work will get less line work. Um, like the out, like you can see here for the fins here, the the hard outline is getting a lot of attention, but the inside details are a lot less uh, stark and contrasting. I'm going a little bit lighter with those details. And that's sort of similar to what you would want to do um, when you're drawing and you're trying to determine line weight. So further back, the lighter it gets, closer to the viewer, the darker it gets. Outlines darker than inside details. And um, in addition to uh, the bottom of things or wherever the shadow is going to be, it might not always be the bottom. You want to go darker with that as well. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. I'm a beginner and I'm focusing on traditional drawing to learn the fundamentals, but I also want to go digital. At what point of knowledge you think I should start drawing digitally? Mm, I'm not sure you understand that question. What point of knowledge do you think you should start drawing digitally? Maybe you could rephrase it a little bit, help me out here. Um, 
it if you're looking for digital art to just fix you know if you feel like you're not a good artist but that if you could just get a tablet or something then you could draw better that's not really the case you still have to know the fundamentals but um if you are wondering you know how good you have to be to start using digital you can start using digital now if you want you could start learning on digital if you but you'll still just have to learn the fundamentals right um i think there's nothing wrong with learning to paint or draw on a tablet as long as you make sure you go through the whole process of everything you need to do to learn the basics and the fundamentals before you just jump on to something else. Um, Cause I mean, I guess there are a lot of options that you can use uh, when you're working digitally, but that doesn't mean that you should ignore the basics, right? Like there's still a lot of stuff that you can learn without using any of the fancy tools in Photoshop before you get to all that stuff. So. Um, have you noticed two bugs with new update? One where the quick line tool now results in a dotted line and two where the select tool won't continue after undoing. Uh, yeah, actually, I, well, let's try the quick line one and see what happens. Looks like my quick line's working fine. I was having a problem where all my brushes were dotted lines, whether it was a quick line or not, but, uh, it seems like they fixed that. And then the other one I noticed uh, was, yeah, the selection tool whenever I was trying to select something, it would disappear. Let's see if it does it again. It looks like they fixed that one too. But yeah, I was having that problem. I did. If you're still having that problem though, I found that um, it wasn't showing up, but it was still there. The line was still there. So like, even though I couldn't see the dotted line, I just finished my selection. And when I closed it, the selection worked. You just can't see it. Um, let's see, does a paper-like screen protector work and do you use one? Um, when I very first got my iPad, someone told me that I should use one because it will feel more like drawing on paper. So I got one and then took it off within like 10 minutes because um, I just didn't like, I don't like how screen protectors seem to kind of I don't know, maybe it was just the ones I've used, but they seem like they sort of skew the color sometimes or like the oil from your hands affect them in a weird way, especially the matte ones. And I just, I don't know, I wasn't really that big of a fan. So I got rid of mine and I just got used to the feeling of drawing on glass to the point now where I don't really mind at all. So up to you, 100% your own decision. But, uh, yeah, personally, I don't really use one. I know a lot of people do. It's up to you. They, I don't think that they hurt necessarily. It's 100% personal preference. I don't think one gives you an edge over the other. So um, do what works for you. and Because that's the thing. There's not always there's not like one right or wrong way. I think a lot of times as beginner artists, we want to depend on people who have come before us a lot to kind of help guide us and where we should go and what we should do with our art. And that's good to have mentors and stuff like that. I'm not I'm not knocking that at all. Um, but I do think that sometimes we get dependent to the point where we don't just try and experiment on our own. We don't try and figure things out and that it's good to experiment and just see what you can come up with. That's how new things get discovered all the time and how you can um, come up with your own interesting techniques and ideas. So you don't just have to do what I do. Um, do, 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 let's see. Is there a way to imitate acrylic drawing on a tablet? I don't even know what acrylic drawing is. Um, like acrylic paint, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, maybe try maybe try rewording that. Um, there is an acrylic paint brush, and I suppose that if you took the time, you could probably get it to look quite a bit like acrylic paint. Um, okay, yeah, that's what you're talking about, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's 
I would just use the acrylic paintbrush and see if you can replicate it. If you're really wanting something to look traditional and you're working digitally, there's definitely some tricks you can do in Procreate. But if you want to paint like you would be painting if you were working uh, traditionally, then what I would recommend would be to use ArtRage um, instead of Procreate. ArtRage is a really cool app that is specifically designed to feel like you're painting like you would normally paint. The only thing with Art Rage is that it doesn't, it's not as, you know, comprehensive as Procreate. It's a lot more streamlined and simplified because they're assuming that you're trying to paint like you would if you were oil painting or painting with acrylics instead of going all crazy and doing all these different things and abilities and stuff that you can do in Procreate. But um, overall, still, I think it's a pretty good software. Um, I think it's pretty cool. So um, let's see, what's the next one? I use paper. So uh, yeah, uh, Bahi, Bay, not sure how to pronounce that. Um, recommends paper, paper-like as a screen protector. So maybe check that out. I don't remember the name of the brand I tried. Uh, it was a while ago. Um, like years ago when I very first got it, I, I think I tried a couple. Um, but honestly, I now I'm at the point where it's kind of like I don't really feel a need for it just because I'm comfortable working with what I have now. Sort of like if it's don't if it's not broke, don't fix it sort of attitude. So I don't know. I don't really feel the need to get one. I mean, if someone if someone sent me one or someone was like, dude, you got to try this. It's amazing. I'd give it a shot, but um i don't really feel the need to go out and buy one just because i think what i have now works pretty fine all right can you save this live stream yep uh it automatically saves and will be posted on my youtube channel so you can watch it back um in case you can't stay for the whole thing or whatever issues you have you can watch it back later and read the uh, comments too i believe live as well We're gonna be going a little bit longer today than last time. Last time we only went 30 minutes because I didn't have a, wasn't drawing anything, so there wasn't a lot to work on, but I think today we'll go a little bit longer, show you a little bit more in depth process here. All right. There we go. It's all right. It's turned out all right. It's kind of interesting, kind of cool. And I'm going to cut his tail a bit shorter. Let's see. Um, thanks, my selections tool. Is there any more that I missed up here? Oh yeah, let's go up a little bit. Is there a way to make the toolbar for adjusting opacity, size, and color picker wider? Because sometimes I can't activate the color picker easy, easily. Um, I don't think so, but I know what you can do is change it in the gesture controls so that you don't have to use that. I never use this for the color picker. One way to get the color picker is if you just hold your finger down or your stylus and don't move it, it'll bring the color picker up automatically. That's what I do. But if you go to gesture settings or preferences and then gesture controls, 
you can, let's see, eyedropper, you can set it to whatever you want. So right now it's set to tap that little icon, but you can set that icon to be anything you want. Um, you can set it to a finger touch. So if you just tap on the screen with your finger, that could bring up the icon. You can combine that button with the touch. You can do that button with Apple Pencil. Uh, Apple Pencil double tap will bring that up or touch and hold, which is what I have it set to is touch and hold will bring up the eyedropper. But if you want to, you could set it so that you double tap and it'll bring up the eyedropper or you just touch the screen once with your finger, that'll bring up the eyedropper. So um, can't make that wider, but you can change how to access it as far as I know. Selection still still isn't working. Sorry about that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you can get that fixed soon. Um, how can I make money with my art? Any advice? Good question. I that's a I like talking about that, and we can. I'm I'm gonna do a, a, some series of videos on that, but and I'm I'm actually thinking about writing a book on it as well, because um, I just hate the oh sorry excuse me I hate the stigma of starving artists. It drives me crazy when people act like that and think that, but um yeah i have a lot to say about that we'll go over that in a second here um currently studying at fang jewel school of design retrials on udemy have been so helpful awesome i'm honored to hear that um i have a buddy who got offered to teach there um yeah fang jewel is pretty cool have you tried to make 2d animation before uh like a couple times when i used to work at discover card i would make a little Little flip animations on sticky notes. I don't know if you count that. <laughs> I have a question. All right. My digital paintings always look like plastic. How can I prevent that? Um, so, okay, we're going to go in order. We've got a bunch of them here. Let's go back to do, do, do. How can I make money with my art? And then we'll start going down from there. So um, there's tons of ways, tons of ways to make money with your art. Every time you make a piece of content, it should be, um, you should be using it in multiple, multiple ways. Um, and trying to get as much value out of it as possible. Oh, we're Um, so for example, if you, let's say you create a painting and I'm, I'm not always perfect at this myself either. Um, but when you make a painting, you want to be sharing that on all of your social media. You can make a video out of that. You can make a print out of that. You can do a tutorial on how to do that. Post it on Instagram, right? There's tons of ways that you can be getting it out there. And you want to be making sure that you're taking advantage of all of those. So we're going to do this really quick, just as a guide here. So I can get this perspective right. Um, Sorry, focusing on this, <laughs> so hard. <laughs> so hard to talk and paint at the same time. Didn't even work how I wanted it to anyways. All right, well, screw that, let's get rid of it. Um, so I just focus on your question here for a second. Um, how to make money as an artist. So yeah, you wanna be, each piece of art should be generating multiple ways to get attention for yourself. Um, but there's all sorts of ways. One would be creating prints of your art and selling your art itself. You could put it on t-shirts, you put it on mugs, all those things. And there's lots of ways to do that online without having to put in any money yourself, like Society6 or Redbubble. If you are really dedicated, you can make your own Shopify store and take a bigger cut um, so that you don't have to give you know Society6 or Redbubble as big of a cut. You can also teach courses like I do. Anyone can go on Udemy and start teaching what they know. Um, one of the best ways to learn is to try and teach somebody else. That's a big one. <clears throat> Obviously, getting hired by someone doing freelance work or um, another sort of job, um, like a full-time job at a studio or something where you are 
working on your art, doing either concept art, illustration work. Um, you can also, <clears throat> um, put your stuff in an art book, set up a Patreon. There's all sorts of ways and a lot of them take time to get to that point. So what you need to do is start now. It takes a while to build up an audience and to get followers and people interested to the point where you start making money. Um, to give you like an idea, I'll just give you like, I'll be pretty transparent about it because I'm passionate about helping people make money with their art. But um, you do, or YouTube, for example, and this isn't to discourage you, this is to get you started now so you can um, get going on it, is that on YouTube, I have almost, I think, 27,000 subscribers as of right now, and um, I run ads on all my videos, and I make probably about $150 a month from YouTube ad revenue, which isn't really a ton. Um, to some people, it might seem a lot, but it's, it's not enough to live off of, right? Like, you couldn't pay your bills with that and provide for a family with that much money. So um what that means is that you need to get started now because it takes time to get to that point um i took a huge break from youtube when my son was born i was working on other stuff so if i had spent that time uh actually pursuing more youtube stuff it probably could be higher but um if you make a video every day and it's a good i mean it's we're talking good content it's not just um crappy thrown together, you know, your art is pretty good and you're really creating content that people like, then you could probably get within one year to maybe around a thousand dollars if you post a video every single day and it's decent, decent quality. I bet you could get to a thousand dollars a month in a year. Um, but even still for a lot of people, that's not enough to live off of, which is why I say you really need to start now and start making a lot of stuff because it takes time. It takes time. But the best thing you can do is just start making it is start getting stuff out there for people to see because that's how you get noticed. That's how you start making money. So, um, honestly, probably the fastest one would be Udemy. If you, uh, if you start making Udemy courses, you could be making money in a couple months if it's a if it's a decent course. Um, you kind of have to know how to work Udemy and get people what they're looking for. But uh, if you can do that, I think Udemy is a great option, um, especially if you have a specific style of painting that you want to teach or your um, sort of a soft expert in a field. Um, or a given area, you have a lot of experience in it. Um, that's the sort of thing that you can really capitalize on. All right, let's bring this tail up. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, short answer though is you wanna make one with your art, you gotta start making art and you gotta start making a lot of it and just getting it out there. for people to see. And if you re and to make a living really, realistically, you're gonna have to have multiple revenue streams. So you're probably, I mean, maybe, maybe you don't, like maybe you only live off of YouTube, but um, your best bet is going to be to have like, uh, like YouTube and, you know, prints and, you know, different things like that. You can put tutorials on Skillshare or, you know, sell brushes that you've created on Gumroad, stuff like that. You're going to need more than one source to live more than likely as an artist. Um, but that's okay because it makes it so that things are kind of broken up. And if one of them goes down, you're not totally screwed. So uh, keep that in mind. All right, so for today's video, I think this is good enough of a drawing to start painting. It's not super, super detailed, super spectacular, but we do, let's work this tail a little bit more. Having a hard time getting that perspective right while I'm talking.
good enough. We'll run with that for now. Um, let's see. Green from Singapore. Oh, yeah, we already read this one. Let's see. My digital paintings always look plastic. How can I prevent that? A couple ways. One, um, <clears throat> I'm going to guess that the reason why I'd have to look at your art to really give you a solid answer as to why, but I'm going to guess that it's mostly because you're using way too much soft brush for your shading and not enough hard edges when you're doing shadows and stuff like that and highlights. It makes everything look really smooth and plasticky, like kind of Barbie doll look. Um, and there's not really any texture. You gotta add texture, otherwise it will look like plastic because you painted it that way. You painted everything to look smooth and clean when it's really not. So if you're painting fabric, don't paint fabric like you would paint a plastic bottle. Paint fabric how fabric looks, which is really textured, right? There's that weave in the pattern of the fabric and the thread work, and that's gotta be incorporated. Or if you're painting stone, Stone's not really reflective and shiny and glossy. It's not going to have bright highlights. It's not going to um, be super reflective of its environment. It's going to be really rough, and the highlights or the lighting is going to be really diffused and broad. So think about the texture, and before you paint it, if you feel like, oh, I'm just painting this like plastic, do a texture study. Go look at some pictures, look at texture studies other people have done, and try to replicate it. Um, the course I'm working on right now, it's really long. It's taking a long time, but it's the ultimate guide to painting everything. And it goes over that basically. It's as many different subjects and textures as I could think of in one course, multiple types of stonework, metals, liquids, um, weather patterns, stuff like, like as many th lighting situations, as many things as I could think of, I threw into one course. Um, and it's taking a long time to put together, but that course I think would help you a lot dealing with making sure things don't feel plasticky. But um, first thing you could do now to help with that, I would say, is if you're using just a soft airbrush for all your shading, stop. Try switching to something else that has um, opacity sensitivity, so that the like the harder you press, um, the darker the darker or more opaque it gets and the lighter you press, the more transparent and try and use that to get variation in your, uh, in your opacity instead of just a soft airbrush. That should help a lot. I'm gonna have to get up for you in a second and grab a drink of water. My throat's getting a little raw. All right, um, next one. Can you give me advice about lighting? I have a hard time trying to figure out lighting, shadows, and accents. Um, well, that's pretty broad. Maybe you could be a little bit more specific. Do you have an issue with, like, the color of the lighting? Um, trying to make it feel a certain way? Do you have a problem with what direction the lights come from? You have a like figure. You have a problem figuring out where shadows are supposed to go and highlights stuff like that. Um, what ex what exactly do you mean? I guess maybe because that's pretty broad. So if you can try and be a little bit more specific, um, surely I'll buy that book. Uh, he's not teaching here at the moment, is he? Um, no, he's not. Um, he went there, he was a student a while ago, and, um, uh, things you asked him to come back and, and teach, but he lives in the States and wasn't sure if he was in a position to go back, <clears throat> to go back there and be a teacher. So last I talked to him, he was probably not going to, but maybe in the future, he said. So we'll see. He does environment design. He does some crazy good. He mostly does like uh, like technical work, really like hard surface sort of stuff. Um, 
like military barracks or like sci-fi type things, but he also can pull off some pretty cool organic environments as well. But yeah, he's uh he's not teaching there right now. How do you balance your art life and progressively grow with your personal life, family, socializing, etc.? Good question. Um so my take on it, I don't know, this is my this is my personal feelings on it is that there's there's not really such thing as work life and then art life and then family life. It's just, I feel like it's just life, right? There's not, I mean, we can break them down these categories in our head if we want, but really it's just life, right? There's only, all there is is life. Um, and I think just being aware of your responsibilities and the needs of the people around you that you have an obligation to meet. You obviously don't have to meet everyone's needs all the time. That would be bad and unhealthy, but fulfilling your obligations as well as, um, I mean, if relationships important to you, then you're going to want to take the time to make sure that person feels loved um, and that you're meeting their needs. But I don't know. I think I'm probably going to get flack for this, but I think a lot of times people use the the problem, the difficulty of finding like a balance in art and life and stuff like that as an excuse or a justification for either a not being very good at their art because they don't spend that much time on it because this, 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 you know, I got, I have to balance all these other things in my life. It's too hard. You can always find time for things that are important to you always. Um, it's just, it really just comes down to what your priorities are. Or they use it as an excuse to explain why their relationships are bad because they just, it's too hard. They don't know how to balance their art with the rest of their life. And then it causes problems. I really think that it's just, they, they just have bad, bad interpersonal relationship skills. They have poor emotional health perhaps, but I don't think it's because of art that they can't find the balance between art and relationships. I think it's because they just, aren't really working on their relationship. They don't know how to do that. So I don't know. That's my two cents. Um, I don't know. If you have family members who are mad at you for doing art so much, um, I would look at it this way. Are they mad because they want to spend time with you and you're not like giving them attention or affection? Because I can understand that. If they're mad at you because they think you should be doing something else, like they're like, why do you spend so much time drawing when you should be spending time studying to be a doctor and you don't really want to be a doctor, then F those people, they don't actually care about you. And even if they're parents, I say, uh, find a way to somewhat distance yourself from them because they're going to be super destructive to your happiness. Um, all right, we'll go on to some more questions in a moment here, but I'm going to go grab a drink of water really quick and then we will start doing some painting on this guy now that I've got him selected. <clears throat> All right, back. Actually, I'm going to bring my water over here one second. Okay, uh, we are back. So, um, what was I saying? Um, oh yeah, we're gonna fill this guy in. So I'm thinking, um, I'm trying to decide. We were gonna do grayscale and then add color, but I just don't picture this guy having a ton of color. And I just don't think it'll illustrate the, the topic super well. I do have a whole course where I go over this or a whole lecture in one of my courses, but I think I thought I did a video on this too, but I can't remember. Um, I swear I did. Maybe one of you guys in the comments can help me out. You remember, but I'm fairly certain I covered a video talking about this. Let me see if I can find it. I'll post a link.
Maybe, uh, maybe not. Yeah, I guess I haven't. So, I will, I will do that. Might be a while till I get around to it. I got a lot of other videos lined up too. But in the meantime, you can totally go check out my course, um, The Ultimate Guide to Digital Painting. It goes over that technique of starting the grayscale and then adding color. So, definitely check that out. All right. Um, I'm not trying to make money. I'm just doing it because I enjoy it, but I am only 15. I have no idea what kind of job I want later. I have a piece of art I'm working on right now. Can I still send it to get critiques? Yep, I can totally do that. Or does it have to be completed? You can send it even if it's not done yet. Um, good luck and I mean, good luck in figuring out what you want to do. Um, there probably be people who tell you that art is not a career choice, but it totally is. Uh, there's tons of careers out there from illustrator to, uh, concept art to graphic design, all sorts of different things. A lot of stuff has to be designed and have art done for it. So you have plenty of options and you're young, so you got plenty of time. Hi, you are a big help to my art. I struggle with coloring my art all the time. I really like a digital artist mistakes video. Oh, awesome. I'm glad that you enjoyed that. Hopefully it helped you fix up some of the problems you're having in your own art. Um, do gong, gong, gong. Yep. <laughs> what pencil were you using to draw this? I usually only use a pen on Procreate. Yep, what uh, Fer Marufo said, technical pencil with the max size increased. Um. I want to digitally paint, but I'm getting the iPad pen for my birthday. Do you think it will help me paint? Also, any tips to avoid mistakes when first starting? Um, the Apple Pencil with the iPad Pro uh, is great hardware for digital painting, but if you don't understand the fundamentals, it's not going to turn you into a master digital painter by any means. You still have to know how to draw and paint and do all the stuff. Um, It'll just make that job easier for you, but it doesn't. It's not a substitute for talent, so or skill. So, um, any tips to avoid when first starting? Any or any tips to avoid mistakes when first starting? I would say, don't um, don't treat every piece like it's got to be your masterpiece. Just start and just start experimenting. Paint something, try it out. Try something new. Try a bunch of different styles till you find what works. Um, don't get married to one idea or one painting and then feel like, you know, you just got to keep noodling it. Paint it, give it a shot, and then move on to the next one. The more stuff you get in, the better it will be. I learned to digitally paint very quickly. In about three or four months, I was doing professional work, digital painting from having never done it before. So if you put the time in... Um, you can make it happen, but it also really helps if you already have really solid, strong fundamentals traditionally before you jump in digitally. Very cool, Environment 9. Oh, cool. Pizza Box Demon, Environment Design is, uh, there's definitely a need for it. Everyone wants to be character designers and creature designers and stuff like that. No one wants to be environment designers and there's a huge need for it, so good call. Um, in life, there are things you want to do and things you need to do. And when the two things are over, that's how you become happy with your life. Good advice. I want to make creatures and make really detailed illustrations, but I always mess up. Everything is out of order. I put a lot of detail into a small section. Is that a problem? Should I start big? Yes, that is a huge problem. That's another video I'm going to do talking about... Um, talking about... Sorry, I'm getting, <laughs> trying to paint, trying to make color decisions and talk at the same time. Answer this question, then we'll move on with the painting, and I'll come back and answer some more. Um, you should start big. Um, when you start really detailed, I'll just I'll do a quick example here. We'll show one. Okay, so this is a painting I was doing earlier. You can see this layer here. This is my drawing layer. I started out really loose and sloppy, and then refined it to this. And there's a big difference here, right? Clearly, that's not a finished drawing. It looks pretty bad. That looks a lot better. What happens when you start really detailed is, let's say I was trying to redraw. Oops, let's get a dark color here. 
let's say I was trying to draw that and I'm starting somewhere with the eye, right? And I am thinking, oh, this guy's going to be so cool and he's really scary and he's got big teeth here and um, big fat head, right? It's not that it looks bad. You could probably pull off a drawing that looks decent like this, but the problem is is that you've really set yourself up to be locked into a specific um, piece because you spent so long rendering these little tiny details on one specific spot that now you really don't want to undo it or go back and change anything because you spent so much time, even though it might not fit overall with the whole image and it might actually end up looking pretty bad. Or maybe not even bad, but maybe you could have made it better, but because you got so dedicated so quickly to this little piece that you rendered so tightly before you had the rest of the thing blocked out, now you're not going to be likely to change it and make it better because you already put in all that work and you don't want to go back and undo it. What would be better to do, and at least for me, I find that when I just start drawing with details and I don't start off loose, I almost always end up drawing something from a side view or front view because I have a harder time drawing three-dimensionally when I don't plan it out. So what you should do instead is block things out. Block out this guy's head, what you want it to be like instead of just jumping in and doing all this um, detail work. You start out with something really simple and then you can go in and start adding details. So you can see here roughly the same thing, but a lot looser, a lot simpler. Right? And then what you can do is make a new layer on that and start getting more and more detailed. And that's going to, your drawings will turn out a lot better because once you get to this point, you can be like, okay, because this isn't super detailed, I can take entire selections. Like let's say I want his nose or his muzzle to be bigger. You can select that whole thing, drag this out, or maybe I want it to be longer, drag it down and you know, kind of roughly fill it back in. And now I can work with this some more. And because it's so loose and so rough, I can switch it around all day long and not have to worry about ruining my drawing. Because if I try to do that with something like this that was that detailed, it's going to look weird. It's going to mess up lines. And I, I'm not going to be happy with it. So what I would do is start loose and then get more detailed. That's my advice. So. Um, yeah, start big, work small. So uh, send you a mail, review my drawings, will do. Um, I haven't done any in a while, so I kind of got a list stacked up, but I'm going to get to them. But uh, it might be a while until I get to yours, so just keep that in mind. All right. Takes practice, yep. Looking at other people's art or drawings helps. Yeah, one of the best ways to improve, I think, is copy other art. Um, I don't mean copy other art and then try to pass it off as your own. I just mean do studies of artists that you like and try and replicate their drawings. See if you can create sort of the same thing. Um, I think that can help influence your own style and help you learn how to draw. That's what I did a lot. Once spend 30 hours making a piece of dance finish. That's uh, rough. Uh, you should finish it. Hey, Austin, hope to bring up more vids with your new style. Hey, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it didn't get, <laughs> when I first started doing it, I showed it to my wife and she was like, it's, yeah, it's all right. And I was like, oh, well, I think it's cool. So I'm glad you appreciate it. I, uh, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to explore it some more and see how I can work it. So let's start adding some color here. I'm going to do his fur like a cream cream color. Um, I know dugong is not cream colored, but that's what color I'm doing it. Okay. 
So we're gonna start with that as our base coat. And I'm going to get a nice textured, let's go with, yeah, well, uh, I wish that my painting brush, I don't know, we'll give it a shot. I wish I hadn't messed with my painting brush, but we'll see if we can make it work. I have a feeling that we're gonna have some issues, but we'll try it. All right, so bottom of the uh, belly, I'm gonna do a desaturated gray. Um, it's almost the same value as him, but it just has less yellow to it. It's a little bit cooler. I'm gonna do this for his underbelly here. So like I mentioned, if you missed it, I'm gonna do the grayscale thing on something else. I'll post a video of it. Maybe we'll do it next Friday. We'll plan something that can be done grayscale. Um, but uh, yeah, for now we're just gonna do, we're gonna do this. Cause he's just not super colorful. All right, um, that looks good. Okay, let's go to make a new layer here. I'm gonna do this one a little darker. Do a little bit of a slightly darker pattern on his back here. Yeah, I hate this brush. <laughs> it looks horrible. I just tried this round brush down here. I don't know what settings I've put on it, but maybe it will be better. Yeah, it's a little bit better, a little bit softer edge. We'll knock it back a little bit though. All right. You can see I'm not really worrying too much about the fins because we're gonna do those on a separate layer and it's gonna go over what we're working on now. So it's okay if we kind of go outside the lines and get into that fin area. And you can see I'm not, for those of you who were talking about plasticky looking things earlier, you can see that my edge is not perfectly smooth. It's not a perfect gradation. I have a little bit of variation because in real life, that's what things look like, right? Um, Things are almost never a perfectly smooth gradation unless they've been per specifically man-made and engineered to look like that. So especially when you're drawing organic stuff, you gotta keep it smooth and organic. Sorry, not smooth, the opposite of that, broken up and organic. All right, and let's see, let's mess with this just a little bit. And we'll go a little darker, do just a bit on the very back. All right, cool. Now, um, let's move on to, let's look at some questions really quick. <clears throat> What's a good way to draw creatures in a way to give it texture, like fur or scales and making it look creepy or cute? All right, wow, that's a lot of stuff jammed into one question. Let's tackle that. I'm gonna grab a drink really quick. <clears throat> um, so what you can do, um, let's go with the first one. What's a good way to draw creatures in a way to give it texture, like fur or scales? All right, so first off, just to make sure that we are using the right terminology and answering your question, talking about drawing or painting because um, you'd go about it different ways depending on what you're doing. If you're drawing it, it's not gonna be the same approach. So you mean drawing or painting, just to clarify. I can answer a little better. All right, uh, I'm gonna go on to, I'm gonna do the horn. I feel like I'm getting this mixed up with another Pokemon that I can't think of, but should I do the horn like blue? Like it looks like ice? 
Oh yeah, that looks cool. Let's go with that. These are just the base colors, by the way. We're going to uh, we're going to be adding shadows and all that stuff. But first, we're starting with just the base, simple base coat. All right, fins. What should I do for these fins? I was thinking orange originally. But I don't know if that's going to look good. Let's give it a shot. Ooh, actually, I think the orange does look good with the blue. Like I said, this is my take on dugong. I can make him look however I want. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool for a base coat if we do that orange and we can do some other, like, patternings and stuff like that. Should I do these fins? Let's do these fins on a separate layer, though. Then the horn. So I have a feeling we might want to change those colors. Bottom reminds me of Vaporeon's tail. Sick. Vaporeon's Vaporeon's a badass, so I can I can live with that. Um, painting. Okay. So. Sorry, just reading a couple messages here. Okay. So painting, how to paint creatures. And so what you're going to do most of the time, it's going to depend. Well, one's going to depend on your painting style. The style that I'm painting in now, which is not the painterly approach I've been doing lately. This is more of building up layers and using multiply and stuff like that to get your shadows if either way though most of the time the the texture is going to come through in the highlights not the shadows okay because that's where the lights going to be broken up and bouncing off different things and the smoother and you know glossy you make your highlights the smoother it's going to look the more you break that highlight up um the the more rough it'll look. Let me see. I'm going to jump into my gallery here really quick and see if I can find an example to show you guys of what I'm talking about. Let's see. Um, let's see if this is a good example. Okay, perfect. So um, this is the demo piece that I did for my course on Udemy on how to use Procreate for all the Procreate tools. At the end, I did a demo showing my whole process. And you can see... If we zoom in here, the um, he looks like he has bumpy, rough skin because in the highlights, instead of doing a really smooth, clean highlight, like on the back of his neck here or on his eye and his skin and stuff like that, it's broken up. It's really bumpy. You can, it's like little dots while the highlight on his frills here, those are smooth because I want that to feel hard and glossy. Same with his horn, it's all broken up. That's how you can imply texture, along with just painting. You can see he seems to have large scales on his neck, and then overall the texture of it feels bumpy and not all smooth. On top of that, using when you're doing your patterns, you can see I use like a really rough brush to do the transition between, you know, doing like these uh, stripes and all this stuff on his skin. I didn't use like a perfectly smooth, totally opaque brush. Um, so that's that's the main way you can see like if we look down his claw smooth highlight for smooth glossy stuff broken up rough highlight for things that have texture so hard to answer in like a short little snippet but that's uh that's my advice so um uh sent a dragon awesome thank you i'll check that out when do you use multiply so what multiply does is it takes a layer and it's going to multiply the value of that of whatever is on that layer by whatever is underneath it so for example i'll show you in a second when we get to it but i'll explain now what you use it for um what i use it for primarily 
is doing shadows because it does a really good job of preserving whatever colors I painted underneath. So whatever patterns or things like that painted underneath, I can now add a shadow on top and it won't mess that up. It will just darken everything equally based off of that uh, multiply layer. The other time I use it might be for doing patterns or markings where I want to preserve the shadows, but add some patterns on top of it. Then that would be another opportunity for you to use a multiply layer. So shadow layers mostly and occasionally markings. Once again, this is all stuff I would really recommend uh, checking out Ultimate Guide Digital Painting. Go super in depth about all this stuff and has a whole lecture on all of the layer modes and everything that you might use them for um, all in one spot. All right. Finish up this fin. Do his eye and a uh, few other marking type stuff, and then we can move on. Benefit of doing this all in separate layers is that I can just come back and erase stuff away. Keep it nice and simple. All right, and I'm going to lower the opacity on my line art because we eventually, I think, want to paint that away mostly. But let's see if we want to mess around with this a little more and do a different color. Maybe we want to keep it blue and then go with the icy theme since he's an ice Pokemon. Maybe not. I think we want to do orange. and spice it up with a little bit more, a little bit more detail. Um, I personally want to hear a little bio about yourself. If you went to art school or if not, then how did you achieve the arts that you have today? I imagine you've already discussed this before. Picture mailed to you, maybe a perfect example of how to add texture. Cool. I will, uh, I will get to that, Peter. Thank you for Thanks for the submission. All right, so a little bit about myself. Well, I, let's see, where do I want to start? I, um, let's do a new layer here and start working on his eye while I talk. I was totally into drawing when I was a little kid and I would draw all the time. I was really interested in it. Um, and then about probably sixth grade and then into junior high, like seventh grade, I kind of stopped because I, <clears throat> I was kind of embarrassed and I thought that girls would not want to date me or like me or be interested in me if they saw me drawing all these weird creatures and dragons and monsters and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so I kind of stopped drawing because I thought it was too embarrassing um and i mean i was i was kind of a weird kid um not super weird or anything like that but just like i don't know i was sort of nerdy and um so i kind of stopped drawing a little bit and then in junior high i didn't take any art classes in junior high and then i got actually i did okay i took one in seventh grade and then uh eighth grade and ninth grade i didn't take any more and then when I got into high school, I decided to take painting. I started learning how to paint watercolors um, and oils a little bit. And I started following Bobby Chiu in junior high, and I really wanted to learn how to paint like him and do digital art. But I just, my family was pretty poor, and I didn't really have any access to tools to be able to digitally paint. And then when I got into high school, I started learning how to use Illustrator and Photoshop um, and using all that stuff. And so I kind of felt like if I wanted to become a professional, that I was just going to have to go to art school because that's just kind of what I've been told. And I, so I sort of just, I don't know, I just kind of believed it and was like, all right, I guess that's a. Uh, 
guess that's what I'm doing. If I want to be an artist, I want to be a concept artist. So I said I was going to go to the art center and and go to school there because I th thought that was my ticket that if I go to the art center, then I would be able to uh, pursue my dream of being a professional artist. So um, I ended up though talking to, went to Comic-Con and met some different artists and stuff. And I met, what in the, oh, that's why. I met a guy named Arthur Soydem who is the artist who does like Marvel zombies. He does a lot of Walking Dead um, fan art type stuff, illustration work, and um, amazing artist, like master level artist. And I asked him, you know, what's the best way? What school? What do you recommend? And he just flat out told me, he's like, dude, don't go to school. It's the worst. It's going to cost you so much money. You're not going to learn how to do what you want to do. You should do this. And he gave me some resources to go to online. Proco was one of them. Um, and he recommended that I do that instead, which kind of like surprised me because I'd been so set, like I'm going to art center, even though it was going to cost me like a hundred grand. Um, and I was just, I didn't really have any, I was kind of just like, I don't know if I should listen to you or what, what I should do. And I was just so uncertain. And so I, I did kind of decide, okay, maybe I'm not going to go to art center because it is so expensive. That's a good point. Um, what am I going to do instead? I still wasn't sure. I was never super idea on the keen of call or super keen on the idea of college, but I kind of felt like a lot of people do where it was like, everyone told me it was the only option. Um, that if you don't go, you're basically destined to fail. So I was still planning on going. I got offered a scholarship. I took my art to like a college day thing. And I got offered a scholarship to like a small college um, where I live in Utah. Um, but that offered me pretty much a full ride scholarship. And I turned it down because I was like, that school is too small. It's so stupid. I don't want to go to school there. And I was I was just like upset about it. So I turned it down. I uh, got a smaller scholarship to another school that was a little bigger. And I went there. And I was just like, man, this school sucks. <laughs> it sucks super bad. I remember I was like, I asked the teacher one time. I said, we were, we were doing perspective. And I asked her like, you know, we're drawing boxes and cubes and crap like that in college. And I'm like, Hey, you know, kind of done a lot of this stuff already in high school, but what do we, you know, what, what do you need to, how do you take this knowledge, this perspective stuff and turn it into drawing something organic? Um, like, like how do I draw a, or paint, like a, like a T-Rex head in perspective or a person, you know, something that's not just a box. And the teacher of the class was the Dean of the art Institute art the art program there. And she just said, I, I don't know. Good question. I have no idea. And I was just like, so shocked. Like, I just remember thinking like, what the heck I'm paying you. A, like I got a partial scholarship. But I'm still paying you money to be teaching me this. And you don't even know. And I could just, google it in like five minutes and find the answer on youtube like what's even the point so i went there for one semester um finally i was like maybe i'll go try this out of school my cousin was going there uh thought it'd be fun to spend time with him to the original school that offered me a scholarship so <clears throat> that's where i went and called them and was like, I know it's super late and the semester's about to start, but is there any way you still have a scholarship available? And the guy was super excited about me being there. So he scrounged together the money in the department, got me a scholarship. Um, and uh, yeah, I went and I went and did that. Getting me any close to being concept artist and they, they just didn't know they weren't working in the industry that none of them had been working in the industry in like years, uh, if ever. And I just knew that this was not going to get me where I wanted to be. So once again, I dropped out. So I went to about a year and a half 
three semesters worth of college um, doing just like a general's degree and none of them resulted in digital painting classes or anything like that, unfortunately. And yeah, so then the way that I learned to digital paint is I dropped out, went to Discover Card, saved up, started working on Discover Card, bought an iPad, and taught myself, honestly. I took some online courses from Schoolism, great resource that I really recommend. I, on a new layer, right? Yeah. Um, it was really just a lot of practice, as many YouTube videos as I could find. Aaron Blaze was pretty pivotal for me. Um, learned, watching his videos on digital painting, bought some of his courses, took a few courses from the Noman Workshop. Um, I mean, just as much information as I could get my hands on, and I put as much money as I could towards it, even though we were really poor, me and my wife. Um, as much as I could possibly try and set aside, I put towards learning how to get better and just practicing just a lot, a lot of painting. And that's really how, that's really how I developed my style. I, uh, me and my brother got work at an animation studio and near where we lived. Um, the first time we went there, they just flat out, we, I didn't, I'd never done digital art ever really. And we just took in our sketchbooks and some drawings and they're just like, sorry, not quite good enough yet. And eventually I just became so disenfranchised with working at Discover Card that I was like, you know what? Screw it. I don't even care. I'm quitting. And um, I didn't have anything lined up and pretty much no money saved. So I just decided to quit. And and I was like, well, I'm just going to quit and see what happens. I'm going to try something. And the day that I quit, actually, I got a call from that animation studio like, months later like six seven eight months later out of the blue they just said hey we happen to have a project that we need help on would you be interested in coming in and working on it so i did i went in and worked on the project and they hired me on for the next one and i uh i worked there for several months doing assets and character design and stuff like that for their animations and really learning how to get better and work in a pipeline and in the actual industry it ended up not being the best thing because they uh my brother's working with me there too they kind of ended up taking advantage with us they didn't pay us for jobs that we did and went back on contracts and it was our first real like real gig and so we kind of just were like i don't know i guess this is how it is and didn't really object too much um because we were new we were beginners and we felt like we were getting this really great opportunity so we didn't really say <laughs> do anything about it <clears throat> and um, eventually, though, I realized, you know, this is probably not the best. So <clears throat> um, I decided to quit and start working freelance. And I did that for a while. And um, until I started doing uh, that concept or, or that animation studio, by the way, ended up going under shortly after we left anyway, because they were so underhanded, basically. I don't know little sketchy um oh you guys <laughs> whoops you have to tell me that you can't see my screen i'm just talking glad i looked up <laughs> let me see if i can fix it what's going on here you guys can still hear me the heck can you see my screen now can you see my screen now yes okay oh you can hear me but can you see no well what the heck it says that it's uh Let's try again. All right, how about now? You got a screen yet? No? 
Well, shoot. See what I can get fixed here. Still nothing. How about now? I don't know what the problem is. Maybe we hit like a time cap. I don't know. Try one more thing here. See if we can get to work. If not, might have to finish it next time. Finish the painting next time. All right, now can you see it? All right. Um, Here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to see what time is it? Yeah, it's been, it's been a while. I'm going to call We're going to call it a day for today for today's live stream. Um, I'll get it figured out. So hopefully this doesn't happen next time. And then next week we'll finish this painting. Um, I'll post how far I got today on Instagram and you can check it out there. Um, but yeah. Um, one last question I'll answer and then we'll wrap it up for today is schoolism free. I can't really afford classes right now, especially since we got hit by Hurricane Michael. Only reason I have iPads is because of private school. I got a scholarship to attend. Schoolism is not free. I think that if you email them, they offer some sort of scholarship. I'm not hundred percent sure, but you can pay on a subscription basis. It's like $12 a month or $14 a month, which that's pretty cheap um, for classes taught by like world class artists, like people who worked at Pixar and stuff like that. So, um, 